All right, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to talk about women in the church first, and then we'll talk about the overseers in the church, pastors, deacons, etc. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on women in the church because I know you and I know what you believe and I think you believe the same thing I do and the ladies of our church have always been very helpful and very positive and I think that you probably agree with about everything that I would say if I spent a lot of time with this and knowing you the way that I do I, I know that you believe basically what we do uh, here in this church but uh, we'll take some uh, few moments to talk about that and then we'll move on as the Lord allows us. Now let's uh, read in chapter 2 beginning in verse 1 and we want to read <clears throat> over into chapter 3 to get the content and the context uh, before we um, begin okay I exhort therefore that first of all supplications prayers intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men now remember that word supplication means urge I'm urging you uh, the apostle by the Holy Spirit is saying to the church, this is very important, very important. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Then he describes those that we should pray for. Do we do that? Do we do that? You're the Sunday night crowd. I pray that you do. I pray that you do. He wants a pastor, choir director, Sunday school teacher or just a member to do this and he says I'm exhorting you I'm exert I'm just want you to get this across to you that you pray for everyone pray that why so that we'll live a peaceable and godly life in all honesty are you seeing that uh, all over the United States now no no you're seeing the United States going a different direction aren't you and so we need to be praying more now than we ever have. But you know what bothers me? I'm not sure we will. I'm not sure we will. Um, I've heard um, from people that I know very well, and they've talked about folks that they know, young people, older folk that they know, that came to a church just like this, that believe what we believe, that worship the Lord the way we do, but then they begin to get moved away from these uh, churches where uh, nothing but a hullabaloo, spend uh, just very little time in the scriptures, and so forth and so on. And that seems to be the norm all over the United States now. And as far as I'm concerned, that's very sad. Very sad. Uh, when the book, Word of God is not the central focus, and serving the Lord Jesus is not the central focus, something's wrong. Uh, entertainment and so forth and so on. Uh, I remember, I forget how long ago it was, but uh, uh, Becky and Tommy and, and my ch kids up in Tennessee uh, were looking for a, a church and they went into this one church. Everything really looked good and uh, the service just kept going, kept going, singing, singing, kept going, kept going for about 45 to 50 minutes. And so uh, Becky said, Tommy, you had enough? And he said, I have. And they just left and went to another church uh, that was more conducive to what we believe and so forth and so on. That's what we're seeing. And that's what the devil wants. And uh, we, we may be in the very minority, the real minority soon. And we need to stand up for what's right. Amen? And so here's what he says. He says, pray. And then he says, for kings, for uh, all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come under the knowledge of the truth. Is what the Lord wants what I want? Is what the Lord wants what you want? I hope and pray that it is. I'd like to see the majority of our church want to see people saved. By the way, that's the number one focus of evangelism. That's the number one focus of the church and missions. Uh, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in, uh, testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. 
a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now men, that's the admonition uh, to you and to me. That men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. I'd like to see every man in our church living that out, if we're not. I really would. Can you imagine the difference in our church if our men were doing that? But now look what he says to the ladies. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel and shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearl or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. Now let me stop there a second. We'll talk about this, not in length, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. The Lord simply wants a woman just like he does a man to live a certain lifestyle, to live a certain lifestyle. Now, there are a few differences, of course. God's put the man, the head of the home. He's supposed to be the leader. Take the lead. Most women that I have pastored in all of these years, that's what they want. That's what they want. I've heard them say, that's what I want in a husband. Young ladies looking for a marriage partner and they'd been taught that by their mother and by their dad and they said, I want a godly man. I want him to lead. I want him to step out and take the lead. I want him to love me and I want him to cherish me and uh, we need to understand that the Bible says the woman is a weaker vessel physically. Absolutely. I mean, let's just get it there. We men are to take care of our women. You believe that? You don't hear much of that today, but that's that's right. Amen. And um, I would do anything to take care of my wife and my daughter. You try to hurt one of them, you're going to get me riled up. And I'm pretty bad when I get riled up. Say amen, Tom. <laughs> but here's what he's saying. The men are to take the lead and take care of the wife and the, and, and the daughters and so forth and so on. And so he says, in like manner, just like the men have a responsibility, the women have a responsibility. And so down in verse um, 12, But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the men or the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed in Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, charity, and holiness, and sobriety. Now let's go on to chapter 3. This is a true or a faithful saying. If a man, did you notice that now? If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now, I hope you're not in a hurry. I like to make comments along the line because I believe it's important. Now, what kind of a pastor do you want? If you were looking for a new pastor in this church, what would you want in a man that you would call to be your pastor? Well, in verse 1, he sort of gives you an idea. This is a true saying, if a man desire. The word desire means to stretch out. This is something he wants. Now, it's not because he wants it. That's not just it. But God has laid it on his heart. God has called him. I've had the privilege of working with some wonderful pastors and wonderful associate pastors. Some men have felt that they are not to be a head pastor, if you want to call it that, uh, the full-time pastor, whatever it may be, he has been called to assist the pastor. He can be an associate. Some men feel like that's their calling. But um, when I was at an early age, age 16, uh, I felt that call, I sensed that call, and I talked to my pastor about it, and he said, I'll pray with you about it. And then he and Brother Arthur Estes confirmed it, that God was digging with me to be a pastor. And now for all of these years, I've had the pleasure of doing that. Now watch what he says. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. I think some men forget that. A pastor needs to be apt to teach. Not just preaching. Uh, you understand the difference in preaching and teaching. 
And uh, there is a difference there, and I'll not get into that, but he's simply saying if you desire the office of a bishop, you desire a good work, and you stretch out for it, and this is what you want. And then a bishop, overseer, leader, pastor, whatever, be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and then apt to teach. The pastor needs to have uh, that kind of a, a gift given to him, apt to teach. And then there's some warnings here. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Whether this story is true or not, I don't know. At a church, they were having homecoming. And after homecoming, they were going out, there, out to eat. After the service, they were going out to eat. And there, you know how you have homecoming? You have all the food on the tables, you know, and you go around and so forth and so on. And there was a preacher there, and then there was the pastor of the church there. And uh, they were walking around, and this preacher that was a guest picked up a great big chicken leg like that. The pastor was reaching for it. He grabbed it and pulled it away from him. And he looked at the pastor and he said, God ordained from the foundation of the world that I eat this chicken leg today. And the other guy said, well, God didn't tell me that and jerked it back. Now, so help me, this is a true story, and the church split. And they called the guy that took the chicken first. Can you imagine that? They say that's a true story that it actually happened somewhere in the south. Isn't that silly? Stupid, silly things happen in church, right? You'd be surprised. You really would. You'd be surprised. And so uh, a preacher, a pastor, called of God, not a striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Down through these years, I've seen some preacher's kids that, if they were mine, but I'll not say anything. Now, verse 5, if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, not a young Christian, not a novice. Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without least he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, church uh, and men, uh, deacons that are here, you ladies, always keep close to this. And if the Lord was to ever lead me away, if I passed away, I want you to follow these directions that the Bible gives you in finding another pastor. Make sure you've got a godly man. Make sure you've got a man that follows this. And he's a leader. He's not a dictator. But he's a leader. There's a difference. Amen. Uh, a, a pastor needs to be a leader. A leader. And if he is a leader and his wife is a godly woman, she'll follow him. You don't have to worry about it. And they'll work together. Likewise must the deacon be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, nor greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. Now watch, and let these also first be proved. Let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Now that's not perfect, blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling his children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Isn't that some good words for a deacon? And can you imagine having a good deacon like that, several good deacons like that, godly men, they're behind the pastor, they're behind the Lord, and I thank God for that. And so, uh, again, in verse 13, for they that use the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou mightest behave thyself in the house of God, 
which is the church of the living God and the pillar and ground of truth. That's a pretty strong statement there, isn't it? If I tarry long that you may know how to behave thyself in the house of God. The pastor and the deacons need to know how to behave themselves in the house of God. And he says in verse 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on into the world, receiving up into glory. Now that's a lot of verses, but that's a lot of stuff to uh, think about and to uh, be the kind of Christian uh, that the Lord would have you and I to be. So I want you to really give attention to these verses. Now, let's just think about uh, the matter of a, a woman's role in the church. You see that in chapter 2, and it begins here, and we just uh, read that, and you have it before you. And so, ladies and, and gentlemen, uh, let's take a few moments and let's just uh, think about uh, the matter of the woman's role, verses 9 through verse 15. In public, she's to dress modestly. What does that mean? You ladies know what that means. I don't have to tell you. It means appropriate. What's right? Uh, you don't want to draw attention to yourself. You wouldn't want to uh, have someone look at you and think evil of you, would you? And no man would want to do that. Ladies can have a tremendous impact on the world, men and women, if they're godly women. Down through the years of pastoring churches, I've seen God use women in a mighty way, a mighty way. But you know what I've observed? They just go about it quietly. They don't draw attention to themselves. They just minister. Whether they're married to a pastor or a deacon or not, they just minister. And we have some ladies here that do that. And I ask this, may God increase them here. Amen? Now, ladies, you have a great ministry to ladies. But you have a great ministry to children, too. And then you can minister to men with your husband. Think about that now. It's a tremendous role that God has given women. There is no way that I would have been a, any, had any success in the ministry had it not been for Sue. I thank God for her. Now, sometime I have to get my little switch out and so forth and so on, but she'll say, I'm sorry, honey, and we'll just go right on. But she's such a, such a wonderful help, smiling at me now, giving me that little sweet look to encourage me. Now, I'm joking, but you know what I'm saying. A pastor needs a wife that will stand behind him and be there for him. And I have that type of a, a, of a wife uh, that I've married. And so here, dressing modestly, sensibly, in other words, you don't dress to attract attention. That's what the verse is saying. You don't dress to attract attention. Now, it doesn't mean that you, <laughs> that doesn't mean that you can't wear nice clothes. Don't, don't get that. I think a lady looks real nice when she's got on nice clothes, don't you? But it's not to draw attention to you because you're a lady that loves the Lord. Amen? And so let's ask the Lord to forever keep our ladies in our church with that kind of attitude, uh, with that kind of, of a spirit, spiritual uh, lesson that she can give. And then spiritually proven. She needs to be spiritually proven. Uh, have convictions. A woman that has conviction. We need men with convictions, but we need ladies that have convictions and strong convictions. It will not turn away from them, will not turn aside from them. And these words here that uh, uh, Paul has given us is very, very strong. Uh, verse 9 again. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearl or costly array, but that which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now, I believe we, we have that here, but we need to continue moving along. So you have the uh, qualifications of the women in the church. They're to learn in silence, in all subjection. You see that there in verse uh, 11. Uh, they must have a controlled family in the home. Now, back years ago, the dad usually always got up and went off for, to work, right? Always. I remember Dad, uh, we would get up of a morning and he would wake me up. I was about six years old, five, six, seven years old, and uh, he said, uh, a man gets up early and goes to work. That's what my dad always said. 
And he was a farmer and a tough man and a strong man. He got things done. And he said, uh, Bob, I want to teach you to be a man. I want you to go with me. And we went to the barn and so forth and so on. And my mother and my grandmother, our grandmother lived with us. Her husband had passed away, and uh, she didn't have a family living except uh, us, and so she stayed with us, and so they stayed and got the breakfast ready, cleaned the house, and get all of that thing ready while my dad and I went to the barn, and we came back, and I went to school, and he went to work. And then when I got older, I went to work uh, with dad. So here's what he, he's saying here. Uh, committed wife to the things of God, spiritual uh, convictions, family qualifications, you see that here, uh, have a, a committed wife and helping him to control with the family and with the, and with the children and then what are the results that are reaped? You see them here. She'll reap the blessings of God upon her life. Her children will rise up and call her blessed and she'll have a wonderful family life and uh, isn't that a great thought? Here's a family with a man and a woman that's been together for years and years. They love each other. The children grow up. They have children. And then we'll be in heaven one day. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Sue and I were talking, I think it was last night, about her family in heaven and my family in, in heaven. And we're talking about one day we'll be there and we'll be with them. I love that thought. Don't you? I love that thought. So ladies, this just uh, going through this a little bit uh, for you. But now let's come down uh, to this matter of the qualifications of the overseer of the church. That would be the pastor, the associate pastor. And then we'll get down uh, to the deacons. I take uh, being a pastor very seriously. Very seriously. Now, I like to have fun. I do. I like to have fun. It amazes me how some people can sit in church all service, through the singing, through the preaching, look like this. I'd like to have a, a button with a buzzer under their seat and have a little button up here and just reach under there and old Keith would go, ah! <laughs> I'm sorry, son. <laughs> he said, that's one. <laughs> All right. But God has a special calling for a deacon, and he wants him to be a faithful man. He wants him to be a godly man. He'll serve the Lord. He'll serve the pastor, and he'll serve the congregation. Now, I'd like to see us be able to ordain two or three more deacons along with the group that we've got. Uh, so that we can really uh, do a better job of, of what we're doing. But a, a deacon has to be a man who's right with God. He's a leader in his home. His wife loves him, and his wife will follow him and listen to his advice and listen to, uh, to his leadership. And so there's the personal qualifications that he has to have. There's the spiritual qualifications. There's got to be spiritual convictions in verse 9. Spiritual convictions. I believe our men have that. And so when you are going to educate, you're going to ordain a, a deacon, you make sure that he has these qualities. And you can read them out of the scripture for yourself. Hey, and he's got to be spiritually proven again. Verse 10. That's why you don't ordain a young man right away. You just don't ordain a young man right away. You've got to make sure that he's got the, the, uh, the qualities to uh, stand up against tough times and not get discouraged and not run off. I've seen churches uh, ordain a young man that wasn't ready yet. He needed to be seasoned and he wasn't. And yet he began to take on an atmosphere. He was a leader. He was a young man. He could do more and so forth and so on. And it wasn't long till he was out of the ministry. And you gotta be very careful when you're calling a deacon. You gotta be very careful when you're calling a pastor to make sure that they have the qualifications. And then there's family qualifications of a deacon. Family qualification. Of course, he'll help the pastor. Of course, he'll take the lead in the church, but he takes the lead number one in the home. Amen? If he is the leader in the home, then that gives him the qualities to be a leader in church. And um, I believe that God has given us some good men here. And then, what are the results? There will be rewards for that man. 
there will be rewards for that man. And the Bible promises us here uh, that uh, if a man who is a deacon, if he meets these qualifications, if he lives them out, uh, then he'll be a man that God will honor and God will use him to be a blessing in that church. I'm going to stop there because I want to spend a little time next week about the pastor. I want to talk about a pastor's call. I want to talk about his qualifications and just go into depth a little bit more uh, about this matter of a pastor. Uh, because one of these days you may be calling a pastor. I want you, and many of you already do, I know that, but I want the church to have uh, this thing down pat. And I believe we do, but I want to go over it about becoming a pastor uh, in a church like ours. So be much in prayer. Now let's pray for our membership as we go our way throughout the week. Let's pray for those that are traveling and pray that the Lord will give them safety and will bring them back to us. And then let's pray for Wednesday and for next week.